Okay, I think we have a microphone now. Let's see what I can do about visuals. Almost there. Ah, oh, here we go. It's kind of hard to get him to stay on. It's okay, I got flat head because my parents didn't want me. Where's the top? I have little uh, flats. You have to kind of like strap them around. All right. Uh, let's see. I forget how to do anything. Hey, here we go. Mallory's back here somewhere, hiding till she gets her hat on. I promised if we, uh, if we got to wa watch your language back there. I know. I promised if we got to 1,000 viewers that uh, we would turn on the 1K lights, and we did. So um, they're back there, and they're on. Uh, we probably won't do the whole stream in the dark here, because Mallory can't even figure out how to get the hat on in the dark right now but I got these little party hats uh, but they're cheap cheap ones they're hard to to get off here oh you can't see from that one come over here there you go <laughs> it's like a dunce cap but it's like a dunce cap for a party uh, I don't I feel like I would get DCMA for that. <laughs> okay, you can turn on those lights actually. Just like a couple so you can see. You know, as many as you need. Yeah. Oh, oh, now it's super bright. Yay. Oh, also we got these uh have these uh, little party favor things. I think they're supposed to work. There you go. Those are actually how the coronavirus was spread. Throughout <laughs> the world. Probably. This is our, our small coronavirus delivery system. Uh, party favor delivery system. It's okay. Mallory's been quarantining herself, and so have I. 
we'll be fine. Her plan is not to talk to anyone. Don't, uh, please don't unplug the SCM while you're back there. Okay, so, uh, aside from the party that's going on here, super party that we're having, uh, to celebrate our 1,000 viewers, I think we actually have like 1,002. Uh, we got little hats and, uh, and the lights in the background, of course. And, uh, and I have some samples from Guatemala that I'm going to look at today. I also have some samples from um, a park in Nebraska called Ashfall um, that I'm working on with a former graduate student of mine who's now getting his PhD and uh, a colleague uh, that I publish, a taxonomic colleague that I publish with, Mark Edland. Um, we're looking at some... Uh, some material from Ashfall State Park. So right now we're looking at um, the base of a core that was collected in Lake Isabel, which is in, oh, we got a new follow? Is that what that was? Or was it a cheer? I can't see. It was a cheer. Micah sent a cheer. Thank you. Uh, thanks, it's Micah. No. Oh my God. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, the bottom of the core, uh, from this lake, so, uh, we're working on getting a paper published associated with this. The bottom of the core from this lake is filled with, um, benthic diatoms, the diatoms that live on the bottom, uh, of the lake floor, or they can live in, um, in uh, like on plants or on rocks uh, or sometimes on other organisms um, besides just plants. And um, this one, for example, that we're looking at right here is a diatom called Eunosia. Uh, the genus is Eunosia. I don't know what the species is. That's a bit of a mystery to me at the moment because um, diatoms can be very regional and um, I don't know the diatoms from Guatemala that well, but uh, one of the things that's kind of neat about the skeletons of diatoms is that even without knowing the species, I can usually tell what kind of environment they live in based on their form. In other words, there's a function associated with the skeletal component of the diatom. And so, for example, um, this little guy here, this nitsioid, uh, diatom that we see and this Eunosia that I was on down here, I know they have to live on the bottom and part of this is because they have a structure called a raphe. Um, but I can actually do a little bit better than that because this group, Eunosia, right here, most commonly occur in dystrophic systems. In other words, they like to live in lake settings or bog settings where there's a lot of organic matter and the um, result of the decay of the organic matter leads the water to be a little bit more acidic. Um, so sort of think of it as like a plant-rich bog or swamp where there's a lot of organic decay. And, um, and these things are sort of specialists that live in those low pH settings. And so even, even not knowing the species, and that's not true for all of them, but just glancing in there and seeing some of these, uh, Eunosia, suggests to me that that's probably the type of environment. So then I could probably narrow it down to species now that we have them in the SEM, uh, if they are described species, and that would help a little bit more um, because the species probably have very particular conditions that we could associate them with. Um, if I scan around and I see this thing here, this diatom is a uh, pinularia, for example. And pinularia also tend to live in these kinds of conditions where the pH is kind of low. So um, that together with the Eunosia kind of leads me to believe that that's a reasonable idea of what this lake system was like. So this is several thousand years old um, part of the record. Um, and even though I have never been to Guatemala, 
and I don't know the Guatemalan diatoms very well, I can just look at a few diatoms that are present here, and from those, I can interpret what I think is going on. So we see this is a benthic diatom, benthic, 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 benthic. This one is benthic. All of the diatoms that we can see in our field of view are benthic diatoms. And by itself, that tells us that the lake system was pretty shallow because benthic diatoms need to be attached to a substrate, and the substrate needs to be in the light. So we have to have basically parts of the environment where the bottom of the lake is exposed to light for the diatoms to grow. So you can see the sort of um, deduction that we do in order to arrive at that conclusion, which is essentially we, um, we can interpret from the fact that it's mostly things that live on the bottom and that the bottom needs to have light in order for these things to grow. And depending on how far the light can penetrate into the water, that sort of limits how deep this lake system could be. I know it's a lake system because the diatoms that we're seeing are genera that belong in fresh water. So I have an understanding that I'm looking at basically a shallow lake system with potentially a lot of plant material and, uh, and uh, organic material and relatively shallow water conditions. So you can sort of see how you put the pieces together and very quickly I can go from just looking at a few little specks of dust in the sample to being able to interpret um, actually kind of a lot about this environment. Are you answering things in chat? No, I have a message, but Kalethon said, is that Ben thick with three C's? <laughs> I'm not sure what I mean. <laughs> it's, it's, you've spelled it correctly, but it's only one C. Uh, normally, um, we can very quickly then figure out, oh, these are all diatoms with raphes. They're all diatoms that live in relatively shallow water conditions. And um, as a result, the sample that we're looking at must represent relatively shallow water. This is just like a little snapshot of my job, basically, like the research part of my job, where um, we can go from um, a sample somebody gives me, not knowing anything about it, and um, in a manner of just looking through a few diatoms, I can already tell them what I think is probably the environment of deposition. Um, and that's actually the sort of, um, you know, thing you do when you become kind of a wizard at this and you, you're used to seeing things and you're familiar with what kind of environments they, they typically live in. Um, but it requires a lot of sort of foundational knowledge about what the genera are and how those genera live. And so if you're wondering what does a paleoecologist do, this is what I do. This is basically a little bit of how I function. So we have a paper uh, where we've submitted it. I think it went into geology and I think it's currently pending revisions. And, um, and as a result, uh, we're working on trying to put the whole story together for people. But at least at this interval, which is at the bottom of our core, um, I think it's probably about nine or 10,000 years ago uh, where the sample is, we know that the lake was shallow, probably had a lot of plant life um, living in it. And um, at least where the core was collected, um, it was shallow and probably had um, sort of a slightly acidic um, or maybe a little bit more than slightly acidic conditions. And, um, you know, everything that we see from that um, original um, few diatoms that I've looked at kind of reinforces that. So this diatom, for example, is in the genus Cochinese, and Cochinese like to live on plants. So uh, this is an example of how we could go, oh, this, this is another bit of evidence that sort of points in the same direction that we had kind of a plant-rich environment and, um, and the diatoms that we're seeing basically fit that model. Now, you know, you might say to yourself, well, how do you know um, that it was shallow um, other than just seeing a few of these? Because you can sometimes get um, sediments that move around in the lake system. And how do we know that um, some of those haven't moved around from shallow water into deep water, which is actually something that could happen. Um, 
The reason that I would assume that that's probably not the case is we only see shallow water species. So this thing right here is shallow water, um, another Eunotia, a different species. Um, and it's kind of an interesting uh, fragilaria. These are kind of in uh, uh, the long skinny type are usually, uh, that are kind of wider, are usually found attached on one end um, in lake systems that are shallow. Here's another Eunotia, shallow. So we don't see any deep water species. We don't see any plankton in, um, in these materials. Here's a, a Diplonese, for example, an internal view of the diatom genus Diplonese. And I don't know what species it is, but I know that Diplonese need to be, um, that need to occur in basically shallow water conditions. So again, all those things basically point us in the same direction. And we haven't really found anything that refutes the idea that it was a shallow lake system um, that we were looking at. And it doesn't matter how old it was um, for trying to interpret the data. I can apply this to basically any conditions as long as the genera that are present in the sample, as long as the diatom that are there at the genus level are ones that I can still recognize. So when it becomes a little dicey is if there's stuff that's so old, I no longer recognize the genera, and then I can't usually interpret that very well. So um, really ancient stuff might be a little bit more challenging, but I could probably still use the um, skeletal structures to try to figure out what I'm seeing. Okay, so what did I miss in there? Anything good? We got the... Uh, we got Del Maximum in the channel. Hello, Del. Did you give him shout outs and stuff? Yeah, I did. Pacific Plankton? <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's sort of a diatom detective is a good way of thinking of it. Um, so Geek Cuisine said, these guys are so small, how would you isolate a specific specimen? So, um, in this sample, what we do is, uh, oh, if you wanted to uh, sequence the genome, what they usually do, I have colleagues who do this, is they will um, put them under a little microscope and take a pipette and just pipette up, you know, one or two of them. Um, or they'll find a sample that's rich with the same species and they'll use this sort of micro pipette to, um, to pull out just one, um, one individual and then they can actually uh, look at the DNA from that individual specimen. So you can isolate them, um, even though they're really, really small. Yeah, so Mallory got that uh, already for me. I included the micromanipulator, even though <laughs> I haven't gotten it to work. Well, we haven't got the pieces to make it work yet. I mean, there we know how- other pieces? Yeah, we need to have like a long piece that's used to like do the pipette part. We don't have those. Um, can you actually, Go grab the micro manipulator and bring it. Thank you, because I was going to showcase that and I forgot. In my uh, excitement to leave the house this morning, I forgot the microphone and then uh, was sort of scrambling to get the SEM samples prepared for you guys. And um, it's been a sort of hectic week for me. So, um, oops, I want to maybe turn that camera a little bit. Um, so I forgot I was going to uh, showcase the, um, the micro manipulator that we have. And um, it's a really simple little device, but um, allows you to basically move things around at the micron level um, on a sample or a slide. Um, it requires a microscope to be, um, you know, to operate because you can't see what it is you're moving if you don't have one. But um, but it allows super precise um, movement with a bunch of just little tiny gears. Um, so I'll, um, um, having Mallory go grab that for us and then um, we'll be able to showcase it. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, let's see. Uh, mittens, micro manipulators, yeah. So, um, in s so Geek Cuisine, they do have scanning electron microscopes as well, I should mention. Um, ours does not have one of these, but there are, um, it wouldn't be helpful for 
uh, for DNA, but there are micro manipulators that people have mounted inside of scanning electron microscopes. And for material that you need to manipulate, um, you know, like within the microscope itself, you can um, then just sort of uh, manipulate it outside of the machine and, um, and move things around, um, reposition them on a microscopic scale. Now, what we look at has got to be gold-plated, and it's basically stuck onto the surface, so I don't think it would work very well for um, the type of materials that we're looking at here, but, um, but it is possible that people do um, have micromanipulator mounts that they've um, placed inside of scanning electron microscopes um, for that purpose or for similar purposes. Um, of course, if it's in a scanning electron microscope, it's not alive anymore, and the DNA is probably going to get destroyed in the vacuum, so um, that wouldn't work very well either. So Mallory has uh, graciously gone and brought us the scanning, uh, the micro manipulator. It's, um, it's really pretty simple. Um, let's see. I don't have a, uh, a full camera version. This is just like a heavy metal plate um, that's at the base of it. And it uses a rare earth um, element magnet. So I can actually take the plate off and just handle it. The, magnet, the rare earth magnets are down here and I just have like a little knob that I can turn and uh, flip it. And basically uh, it will turn the magnets on and off. Um, but it's just basically a bunch of sort of little stands and then um, there's this component, which is sort of the front arm of it. And then these little knobs. And one moves it in the x direction, one moves it in the y direction, one moves it in the z direction. And they move them so, sm you know, so small amounts, such tiny amounts, that, um, that basically there's no way you would be able to detect it, except for if you're looking through a microscope itself at the time. So. Uh, it just looks like a crazy little uh, science arm. And then there's kind of like a, let me see this back here, there's sort of like a little uh, uh, fast toggle version of it. So you can kind of move things around a little. And then you can change the sensitivity of that as well. So um, it basically just allows you to, uh, to manipulate things at a microscopic scale. And what's cool about those, of course, is that um, you can I want to keep that away from my phone, actually. Turn it on. Um, ooh, I'm going to give it back to Mallard. So the plate's actually really heavy, but the micro manipulator's not to keep the plate from, uh, keep the things on there from being uh, destroyed. <laughs> You're loving my hairnet. This is uh, my party hat we're celebrating. Uh, it's a Lego party hat that I got at the grocery store for a dollar. So, um, but you know, I have these things too. Your ASMR. There you go. Hopefully that's not too loud. Put it right into the microphone for you. Uh, yeah, so cool toy, right? Um, that thing only costs about I think about $2,000 for that like metal plate plus the micro manipulator. And then you can put, um, you can put a, uh, um, a pipette on the end of it, a very tiny pipette. Um, you can also just put like a probe sort of thing on there. And um, <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a party hat. And then my face mask, of course, because uh, Mallory's here. Um, but uh, the tiny little gears let you sort of move around on a very small scale. Wait, I'm the reason for the face mask? I actually was H0 well, of the coronavirus. I wouldn't wear it if you weren't here. No, that doesn't make any sense. Because that would be by myself. I'm actually immune to the coronavirus. Cool. I was born with it. You were actually, born with it? Oh, yeah. well, that, that explains a lot. <clears throat> what do you mean, a lot? Um... Take that, rewind it back. <laughs> uh, yeah. Normally I wouldn't wear the mask if you were here. Weren't here, I mean. 
I'm looking out for both of our safety. Really? As you are, I assume. Really? Apparently, I didn't need to, though. Yeah, because I am actually... Because you born, are Corona. I was born... Um, oh, you were born on a pirate ship? Can you say that while you hold your tongue? Is this like a trick? <laughs> I'm going to say something really bad. Or I'm just not going to be able to say it. <laughs> space sail technology. Actually, yes. When I did earn my degree in space sailology, I did actually discover the coronavirus back in 1987. Um, sorry, 1897. And um, I'm sure you've all missed Mallory a lot. Yeah, I'm sure. I love how there's like probably so many new people that have never s heard my stories, and I think I'm like. You're like, who is I'm this like, crank? I'm a charity case. I'm actually part of a program. Who is this crank with the doctor? <laughs> I'm part of a program. They send me over here in hopes that it'll, like, knock something right, but it doesn't work. It's, uh, what we're looking at right here is a different diatom than the ones that we've seen. This one belongs to the genus Solophora. And Solophora are known, if it had been flipped over, it'd be a little more obvious to everyone. Uh, that's a diatomist. Um, but it's even uh, clear here. Um, they have a little structure on the outside of the valve called a canopia, which uh, starts at the raphe, which is this line that runs down the center of this diatom. And then uh, it's like a little covering, like a canopy, um, that covers over uh, the middle part of the diatom. You can't see it because uh, it's on the other side of this one, but, um, but I can tell that it's uh, Solophora based on one, the shape, the uniseriate striae. So the striae here uh, are the stripes along the outside edge, these stripes. Um, and uh, slightly out of focus. And um, the, um, if I go down to the ends, uh, normally Salafer have some sort of like a little platform structure down here where there's, um, no striae and uh, sort of a solid piece of silica. So um, this one doesn't have a very well-developed uh, platform structure, but it's definitely a Solophora. So I don't know what the genus is. Um, I mean, the species, uh, it's close to Solophora levissima, but I don't think that's what it is uh, in any case. Again, a uh, type of benthic diatom. And uh, again, over here is another Eunotia. Uh, one of the um, diatoms we usually associate with acidic conditions and uh, shallow water. So, what am I missing? Hold on, hold on. I'll read it out loud. That's oh, okay. Good. You're going to read it out loud? Yeah, okay. Okay. Blue Zyke said, I am always interested in learning stuff. I must tell you truthfully, this is all fascinating for a goat farmer like me. A goat farmer? You farm goats? Oh, that's I'm cool. Actually you're actually if what? I could switch places with you. You'd prefer to farm goats than be here in the lab with not me? In this, like, I'm not talking about this exact. I mean, like, like I think, like, rather than be in STEM, I would like to farm goats. Oh, okay. I think it's... So you're saying you would rather be farming goats right now than be in the lab with kinda. me? It depends on what he means, but I only have 457 goats. That's... That's... What do you mean only? That's a, that seems that's like a lot of goats. goats. Dell has spent time on goat farms. I don't think I've ever been to a goat farm. I was headbutted by a goat once. I had him on a leash. I was walking him around. What? And then one time a goat ate my shirt, which I was upset about because I was five. And Why is this the first time I'm hearing these stories, you know, Mallory? I have new stories every day. I've been waiting. I can't to tell, tell what's real and what's false with you, so. I'd never tell a false story. I mean, earlier you said you were born with coronavirus, so. And what about it? Exactly. Corona, what, what did all those people say? Coronavirus was around last December. I, I swear I got sick. They're like, they're like <laughs> I swear I, I had a cough. <laughs> um, <And> then, <laughs> I love those people. And then Geek Cuisine said, it's really awesome you guys are doing these streams on Twitch. It's a cool platform for people to share and see science. I think it would be cool to try streaming some of my work, but I'm unsure about the setup. Well, um, you know, there's one thing that I've found that's really nice about Twitch is that there's a really helpful community of streamers. So um, if you need help 
trying to set up science-based um, streaming. Um, you know, the software for streaming is free. The OBS software is free. And um, you just need a computer and a connection that's fast enough, and then maybe some cameras. Um, you know, and then I don't know what your actual work is, but uh, you know, if you could, if you could do it, I think it would be fun. Um, you know, I when I started streaming, um, I was really unsure about it as well because um, one, I don't like, I don't like to put myself like on camera very much. Yeah, you didn't know that? No. Oh, I don't really even like talking very much, to be honest. Um, and the idea of talking for, like, hours in a row is, like, a struggle. So, um, you know, I'm always worried that there's too much dead air or that it's not interesting enough for people um, when I first started. And then, I don't know, I just got over it. So uh, you get to the point where you're just kind of like, whatever. Um, you know, if people don't like it, they don't have to watch. I'm not forcing anybody. So, um, and the way that I sort of um, approached it was when I first started was just watching a bunch of other people. So Del Maximum and Pacific Plankton are two of the people that I watched actually kind of a lot before or right as I started streaming um, to try to get an idea of like how they did things. And uh, Open Set was another one. Um, so all of the streamers that use microscopes on Twitch, um, I sort of just watched how they managed things. And then I thought, uh, I guess I could probably do it. Um, but it, you know, it start, started slow. So, um, you know. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. How about okay. we don't sing a song I'm about sorry. it? I'm sorry. It's, my brain is just songs. That's a cool oh diet gosh, song. Oh gosh. What are you? I said goat cheese is the best. With Greek geek cuisines, granddad kept goats. Uh, I can't keep scrolling up. Blue Zyke was gored by a goat. Well, my shirt was eaten by a goat, so which one of us had it more bad? I mean. Tell me. And then Blue Zyke revealed that they are from Germany. Oh, cool. I'm not in Belgium. Sorry. Wait, another Belgian? Another Belgian. How do we keep getting those? It's probably the time of day. Mm. It's probably like uh, dinner, right after dinner there. Sherlock asked how our weekend plans were. Uh, our weekend plans? Not ours, like our communal week weekend plans, like our, our individual weekend plans. Um, I don't know. What are your weekend plans? Um, find out on the weekend. <laughs> uh, I'm going up to Indy to uh, to spend the night so that we don't have to get up early to drive to the hospital so uh, my wife can get surgery. So, uh, my, my cousin wanted me to DD for her. I oh. went to a frat party. Oh. Which I am, and am inclined to call a certain public safety office about. Oh really? Yeah, because she was. I thought I was like 12 a.m. at the at the latest is when she'll probably ask me to pick her up. She's like, yeah, how about 2 a.m.? I was like, so I'll be making a call. So I'm making a call. No, I'm kidding. Well, you're gonna rat them out. Yeah, I'm a snitch. You're a snitch. Um, That's what I heard about you. Really? Yeah. Really? Somebody snitched. <laughs> it's on. It's on stream. You can find me. Someone said that diatom has a lip. Yeah, this is an interesting diatom. Um, I'm actually s trying to figure out what I think it is. Um, you know, I didn't give it a name yet. And uh, part of that's because I, I don't know what it is. Um, I think this, uh, this edge that's down here, which is the, um, uh, the pseudoscepta, um, there's a pseudoscepta on both ends of it. And... Um, and then there's a, a central area that is sort of um, almost no striae, but there are striae along the outside edge of it. So my guess is that it might be a luticola um, or a star anise or something else. 
Um, but it's a, you know, this is a naviculoid. That's what we call diatoms that have this sort of canoe shape. This one's very canoe shaped actually, or boat shaped. And um, so there's a raphe. We know that it's a raphid diatom. I'm assuming it has a raphe on the other side. The stri are uniseriate. So we can kind of piece together some aspects of it. And then, um, you know, I'm trying to just figure out where I would stick it after that. Um, if it didn't have these little bits of stri that are over here on the edge, I would have put it in star anise. Um, that's where I would, would have thought it belonged. Um, it doesn't seem to have a, um, a stigma, so I don't think that it's a luticola. So now I'm kind of in a quandary because it doesn't fit in the two things that I think it most closely resembles. Um, I don't think that it's, it's not a navicula. It's got the wrong stri for navicula. So it's like, you know, it sort of fits somewhere, but I don't know where. Um, yeah, it, it seems like it could be star anise, but usually star anise don't have stri in the middle part here. Um, and so that, that's where I was starting. Um, maybe there's some star anise that don't have the staros in the center that's complete. Um, the other thing that's a little weird, I can't tell from the angle, but it looks like maybe this side of the central area is a little wider than this side of the central area, but it could be that it's just sort of tilted towards us, um, which creates some optical illusions that um, that one side might be a little wider than the other, but it seems like maybe this side's a little wider than that side, um, which suggests something else. So what it is, I don't know, but um, I'm not opposed to just taking a picture and then trying to figure it out later, so let's do that. Um, in fact, part of what I wanted to do today was to get some pictures of some of these things that I've seen in the light microscope and try to see if I could figure out what they are. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Blue sign. We're not supposed to do stuff around here to uh, Say what? We're not supposed to do stuff in the United States either, but uh, What kind of stuff? He said around here in Belgium there's a lockdown so you can't do stuff as in like you can't do stuff on the weekend. Oh, like party. Yeah. Yeah. I shan't be shan't be partying on the weekend. Don't worry. She's going to shant and then party about it. Wait, what? Hold She's going to shant in her pants. I'm sick of this joke. Uh, stop saying the word shant then. It's, so, it's such a versatile word though. Mm, I don't know. It's very antiquated. Okay. A sea shanty. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good sea thing. Sea shanties are coming back into fashion in 2021. That's so. what I heard. That's what you heard. I heard that. Yeah. Um, oh, she, oh, sorry, Blue Zyph, I did not know. I was kind of, yeah, I'm sorry. You're a female goat farmer. I wow. Isn't there some streamers who stream like um, lamb and goat farming on Twitch? I am the wrongest person to ask that. I think there is. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Blue Zyfe asks, can those things easily mutate? Uh, diatoms evolve very quickly. And um, I have some evidence to suggest that it can happen in less than thousands of years. And um, uh, several papers have sort of documented that. Yeah, Milk Monsters is a channel. There you go. Um, so it's possible that it's something, um, it's probable that it's a species that's unknown, given that it's in Guatemala, but it's also possible that it, it belongs to a whole genus potentially that we wouldn't know. Um, I think it's more likely that it's just a crafty uh, diatom that I haven't been able to figure out yet um, that I would assume is probably very close to star anise or a star anise. Shant for August, yes, I don't know. It's true. I do have all the words. Yeah, Mary's Milk Monsters. We should give a shout out to Mary's Milk Monsters. I think it's, I think it's Mary. Okay. Is it Mary like Mary, not Mary like Mary? Well, I'm going to send it then to whoever this is, and hopefully it works out. Oh. This, it says lizard at the top because I, last time we streamed was the lizard. Change it to lizard. I'm going to change it to Isabel. If is, I could, uh, 
Ball. It's a ball. If I could redo the entirety of the, ling- the English language, I would just change all the it to the e. Stupid Cupid's kid, thank you for the follow. I I have heart earrings in today, so it's almost like we're the same person. Are they heart? They're hearts made out of pearls. Oh, cool. Yeah. I noticed them because your mask is like I know, I interfering really with them. Put them like through my mask. That's what's up. Uh, I'm gonna call this. Blue's eye, you and are you secretly married? Star like anise. Kind of. Okay, well I messed up. What did I do? Species. There we go. Highly scientific name I put on that one. Blue's eye is married. Milk monsters confirmed. They're married to milk monsters. They're married. She has 15 goats. Is she like a lesser goat herder because of this? Oh, like, is there wait, a... what's going on? Blue's life is Mary Milk Monster? Uh, I'm, I have suspicions that Blue's life is actually Mary's Milk Monster undercover. And then also... Uh, 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 totally. Your suspicions. I'm suspicious. I'm superstitious. I'm not just superstitious. I said the joke wrong, but... You did. Is there, like, tiered goat farming? Like, if you have more goats than another goat farmer, you are, like, a more experienced farmer? Where is the cutoff for goat farming experience? This is an important question about and, goat farming. Well, it's where I've decided to take my life. I support your decision to become... Really? Do you think I'd be a good goat Hey, Blue Zyph, would I be a good goat farmer? I know you can't see me, and all you know is that I say things that are wrong, but, but, think about it. This, uh, Dog this organism that we're looking at right here, this uh, fossil that we're looking at right here, is actually a phytolith. So we sometimes see phytoliths mm-hmm. in lake sediments. The phytoliths are um, pieces of silica that grow between cells of plants, and so the... Um, the prefix phyto means plant and lith means rock so it's basically like rock like piece inside of a plant and um, these ones this sort of outline of the cell makes it look like a dog bone but if we saw a whole bunch of them together you'd see that they grow um, in between the cells typically of plant leaves or stems When am I going to do a game stream? Mm-hmm. I don't know. You know, do an animal crossing. we could do an animal crossing stream. I feel so bad when Sylvia asks me. Except for because you don't want to play with my daughter. It's not because I don't want to. It's just always like at a time when I'm in the middle of doing something else. I'll I'm tell her that you don't want to play with her anymore. No. And uh, you don't have time for her. No. Hey, there's a little round thing over here. I don't like help her. I found a little round thing. Uh, I think it's a circle, not a sphere. Is that a microplastic? No, I don't know what that is. A round thing. Is it an egg? It's not an egg. Well, it's I don't know. because it's digested in nitric acid. Maybe it's a plastic. I don't think it's plastic. What would it be? I don't know. What do I have to know? What everything is? Actually, so this is uh, this actually here is a luticola. I can't see the whole thing, but I can tell from the striae that that's a luticola. Um, the genus Luticola, and it's got just a piece of a girdle band sticking over top of it. And then this cool thing right here is a, some sort of anitsia. Kind of look really neat in SEM. They look really terrible in the light microscope. And then this really big thing that you're seeing here is just a fragment of a sororella. Um, I was kind of hoping we'd find a whole sororella that's not covered with junk. I feel like maybe the um, the rinsing could have happened a few more times. Mm-hmm. How many times did you rinse these? Three. Oh my goodness. But one of them I had to walk out because there's a fire drill. Oh. Uh, here's a sorella, but it's got a bunch of junk on it. You can see they, this one's kind of cool. It's a little asymmetric. Um, the shape is slightly wider on one side and slightly skinnier on the other. And this one is laying on some other mud particles. So all these other things you see laying around on the screen are mud particles. We probably should run these through an ultrasonic um, 
to try to break up some of those mud particles and then uh, rinse out the muds. But you can get a nice uh, view of the side of this cerarella in the skin electron microscope. So um, one of the things that's neat about cerarella is you can't see a raphe running down through the middle of the valve, and that's because the cerarellas actually have what's called a circumferential raphe, and the raphe runs around the outside margin of the diatom. And this one happens to be tilted in such a way that we are actually looking at the side of the diatom or the margin of the diatom. And so the raphe is, which is normally not visible to us, is actually on full display. So here is the raphe running around the outside edge on one side, and here's where the raphe would belong on the other side. And the structure that it's sitting on is called an alar wing. And these little windows that are right here with sort of slots on them are called fibulae. So some terminology for you if you wanted to um, learn more a little bit about diatom terminology, you can go to diatoms.org, um, which is the North American website that um, uh, gives all kinds of information about diatom genera and uh, also terminology. But um, this, this little guy, so Cerarella, this large diatom, usually live um, on the surface of um, uh, lake sediments. So they're what we call epipelic, usually. Um, living on mud surfaces or something like that, or they could live on rocks or, uh, or sand. And then uh, this one over here that we're seeing is a different diatom. Um, in the old days, we referred to it as Ropalodia. Uh, in the modern realm, I think it's uh, been forced into the genus Epithemia, but um, it doesn't change the fact that uh, it has a sort of uh, unique shape to it. And um, the striae themselves are actually kind of interesting. So unlike the striae of many of the other things we've seen, when you have them in the SEM, you can actually get a really good idea of um, what these striae look like. So rather than little rows of dots, like we saw in many of the other diatoms, the epithemia have um, these sort of um, little C-shaped openings and oftentimes with, um, with epithemia, ropalodia, the things that belong in this group, those um, little C-shaped openings then um, create sort of these little uh, parentheses-like structures on the outside of the valve. And, uh, or sometimes they look like little clover leaves because you put enough of these sort of next to each other and they kind of have like a clover leaf kind of a structure and um, really distinct, so. What software do I use for? I, that is the question. For what? That I guess I use a lot of software uh, right now. We're using OBS to stream, and then uh, the software that we use for the scanning electron microscope is the um, integrated Vega TC software that comes with the Vega three scanning electron microscope. Um, for that's most of the software that I'm using right now. I saw another little round guy over here. I feel like maybe there's something round. It's something making little round circles in my sample, but I don't know what they are. I don't think those are diatoms. Maybe they're little pieces of phytolith. I'll have to ask my postdoc, Chad, about whether there's they're phytoliths what? that are round. They're what? Maybe a phytolith? It's not the right shape for a microplastic. Dell said amoeba tests, question mark? Um, I would, I, it could be. Um, it does look like sort of like an opercula or something, but um, I would think that most of that would dissolve in nitric acid. It, was, it wouldn't be air bubbles, blue side. Yeah, we're, uh, we're not looking at samples that are underwater currently. They've been dried onto a metal stub. Do a gold bubble. And let's see. Uh, a gold one of these buttons. I used to have buttons. That Anakim. Would, that would work. Said hi. Hi, Anakim. How are you? Hmm. I don't remember what the button was. It's the big red button. 
Is it the big red one? Yeah. Oh. Well, that explains everything. Uh, let's see. Maybe I can find it. The green wire. Hotkeys. The green wire, the red wire. Uh, oh, maybe it's... Droid M. Chamber view, F1. Okay. I think that's what I wanted. Let's see. Do, 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 do. F1. Oh, but that button's not working at all. I don't know. It's broken. Uh, let's see. Oh, there it is. You can see that maybe. Uh, inside the chamber, um, up there, is uh, little metal stubs. And everything in there is in a vacuum. There's no water. And um, everything has been coated with gold. So. Oh, it's I sound I sound eater. Thank you for the follow. I sound eater. Thank you for the follow. You gotta say it a little louder. I. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Why? Otherwise, they don't understand the the passion. Oh. Yeah, you need to be passionate about it. Like. Uh. I miss Eleanor. Uh, really? Yeah. I miss her too. I don't know why she's joking. Rihanna was here at the beginning of the stream just chatting. Really? Yeah. She always shows up when it starts because I think she gets the phone notification and then she says hi and then she just disappears. You know, like, like I came and then that's all I needed to do. Thank you for the follow. I miss the reading. What's their name? Arka blah 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 blah. That's a cool name. Anakin. I don't think either one of us follow Twitch drama on any level. Yeah, I don't. Sorry. Uh, life's been a little hectic for me. Just barely managed to make it out of the house to do a stream today. So uh, following drama in somebody else's life, that's really not what I'm up for right now. You know what? I actually kind of pronounced the person's name kind of good. Really? It was R-C-R-L-B-H-A-B. Blah, blah, blah? Yeah. Yeah. Is that how it's pronounced? Uh, yeah. I actually deleted multiple social media forms. You did? Yeah. So I don't have to see other people online. Basically. You're not on Twitter anymore? Is that what you're trying to tell uh, no, me? No, I'm on Twitter. Instagram? I don't know. It sounds like you didn't really delete any of them. They're other than Twitter and Instagram, just because you only know those two. And Kim, I don't believe you're missing porn. I believe in you. How Sorry. do you make these custom emojis? Custom emojis? Emojis. Like, there's a, there's a... In the channel? Like, the ones that we use for people who are subscribers and stuff? Yeah, where there's, like, Mallory's Monster, but it has, like, a little... Pew. It has, like, a pew? Oh, you just spend the points for it. Customize. You have to go into the points section and sell. So how I am rich. You are rich with points, True. with attack points. I am rich with modify a Su Super, power. that's it. Super rich with attack points, at least. OK, so we're looking at the internal view of a Diplonese. Um, they have really intricate structures on the inside, so they have this sort of costy like uh, rib structure um, that runs around the inside and then uh, the openings between those are where the striae are and as you can see the striae um, the little openings for um, for diplonese are actually very complex include a series of different holes and then um, if we were looking at the outside view of the diplonese this diplonese um, what you'd see is that each one of these holes has a little sort of uh, sort of a covering over it, which is composed of a bunch more holes. So uh, one of the things that uh, we see um, with diatoms is that the intricate structures, usually if there's some set of holes, there's a covering over with more holes. And um, those are usually just used to sort of filter um, out predators or uh, uh, tiny viruses or particles that they don't want getting into the inside of the cell. Yeah, diatoms can get, get, catch a cold. Anna Kim said, the other day I redeemed one more drawing. You owe me one, 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 one. 
I do. Uh, owe you a drawing. I thought I would sketch you a drawing of Mallory's feet since you're fixated with those, but I haven't seen them, so um, I'm just going to draw you a picture of what I think Mallory's feet look like. Much like... I'd say my feet kind of look like... Um, you know, like... You know, like on like old tiny beds and tables, like the lion's foot? Yeah, 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 yeah. Claw I foot. Actually, I actually look like that. You have claw feet. Yeah, they are brass as well. So. so I could just look at a bird. Yeah. And then I could draw bird's feet. I only have three toes. You prefer an SEM drawing to Mallory's feet? What the heck? Oh my goodness. What if I put some, if I drew the SEM and then I put like claw foot on the desk? It was, no, it's like one of those like spaghetti edits where it's, some, it's a picture of someone, but it, they're made out of spaghetti. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me pull it up for you. Oh, I'm making you curious about her feet? I'm not curious about her feet in any way, but like Micah says he's seen them and they look like hands with tiny fingers and a long palm. That's true. Wait, uh, wait what? She said it's true, what? so. Like oh, that, yeah. But instead of spaghetti, it's diatoms. Spaghetti and diatoms? It's, yeah. And it's like bird feet. Stop talking about. Oh. Anna Kim, it was funny at first, but now I do, I do believe you. So, you are the feet guy on this screen. Could I please explain what is happening? Oh, yes. Um, May I no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully, you mean uh, with the diatoms and not with Luke, because I can't explain what's going on with Luke. Um, but uh, what we're doing is looking at a internal view of the diatom diplones and we're looking at it on a scanning electron microscope and currently the scanning electron microscope is collecting an image so uh, the slow scan that you're seeing is it sort of draws the image for us um, is a result of electrons that are bouncing off of the surface of the diatom and in this case the um, the internal view of this diatom and it's basically creating what we perceive to be a picture um, based on not using light, but instead using electrons to, um, to see. So um, I study diatoms, and um, in, in this project that we're looking at right now, I'm just trying to figure out um, some of the diatoms that we're seeing um, so I can later try to figure out, um, to hopefully to species, what they are. Um, to help me interpret what the past environment was like. So this sample was collected from a sediment core, and it's about uh, 10,000 years old or so, maybe a little older than that. Um, I didn't write down the actual like date for that we assigned for each sample. Um, so it's at the bottom of the core, and it's sort of characterizing what we see um, in the early part of this record. And um, there's a lot of weird diatoms uh, in this material, things that I'm not familiar with, and some may be ones that nobody is familiar with. I don't know. Um, I don't think there's been a, uh, a serious analysis of um, uh, the diatoms from this Lake Isabel area in Guatemala. But um, even if they did, these are... Um, some really old diatoms that are 10,000 years old or so. And um, so they may still be things that we don't, um, we don't have names for yet. So um, one of the things I'm hoping to do is, uh, is sort out what we think is going on in these systems by looking at the sediment record and trying to basically interpret um, from the diatoms we see what's the likely environment that it represents. Hopefully that's a adequate description. If you have more questions about it, feel free to ask them. So I'm just sort of scrolling around a little bit in the sample, but um, I actually want to move over to the next sample, which is from um, about uh, a half a half a meter um, above the one that we're looking at in the in the core. 
Hey, we got a bunch of Belgians now. They're invading. It's a Belgian invasion. Okay, Jans, first of all, know your place. Second of all, I miss you. Third of all, okay. This is the diatom belonging to the genus Nidium. I can tell that because the raphe, which is this long structure that runs through the middle of this diatom, is curled uh, this direction to the right um, in both, if we're moving along this axis from both sides. So what ends up is when it gets to the middle, both of the raphes are curled in fundamentally opposite directions. So if we're coming from this direction, it curls to the right. If we're coming from this direction, this one curls to the right. And um, together, then when they meet in the center, they're they're curled in opposite directions. That is a characteristic of a few different genera of diatoms, but the ones that are boat-shaped, like this one, that have um, these punticulate uh, striae, are uh, usually immediately lumped into the genus Nidium. Again, this is a benthic diatom. Everything that we've seen so far in this sample is uh, a benthic diatom. Benthic just means a diatom that lives on the bottom. And um, so we've seen a bunch of a sort of variability in the sample. That's another thing. There's a lot of different types of diatoms in the sample. Um, and that's another clue for us about the type of environment that it likely represents. Um, kind of curious what this thing is. I think it's just a navicula. Just everything's got a little bit of um, dissolution to it, like it's slightly dissolved. But um, the stri on this are super fine. So I'm a little confused by it, but I think they're here. They're just kind of uh, have slight dissolution um, um, aspects to them. Hello. hello. Wants to know what the coil looking thing was earlier. Coil. I'm a little lost. I don't know. Uh, probably the Rafi end, but uh, it could just be the. There was a, a little bit of a girdle band on one of the samples, so that could be what they meant. Uh, what is the limit of magnification on the SEM? If you meant this thing, that's a girdle band. Uh, if you meant this thing, that's the Rafi. Um, what is the limit of magnification? Well, um, our SEM sort of uh, maxes out with good resolution that you can clearly resolve something at around 150,000 times magnification. So um, quite high. A normal light microscope maxes out usually around 1,000 times magnification. Um, and the resolution actually kind of maxes out around 630, uh, 630 times. But uh, you can magnify them a little bit bigger than that. Um, but essentially, that's what you end up with. This is a diatom belonging to a different genus, diadesmus, maybe. Um, this is sort of an aerophilic diatom, a diatom that grows in environments that are exposed to air on occasion. And um, maybe it got moved to Hydrophila, but, um, but it's one of those two genera. And, um, or I guess it could be kind of related to Brachycyra. Uh, in any case, there um, was probably a diadesmus. And, um, and so probably represents uh, an environment that's periodically exposed to air. Again, it sort of confirms the idea that we're looking at really shallow water conditions. So nothing that we've seen sort of has refuted that we are looking at shallow water, um, slightly or potentially a little bit more than slightly acidic in nature, and um, lots of plant material. And um, so I would consider the lake system, at least where we are, where the core was collected, to be more like sort of a bog or bog-like conditions. Um, from this sample. This is a cool one. Very strange diatom.
Yawns, that's a great question. Um, What's the question? Oh, okay. So, first, firstly, Anakin wants to know more about the program. And is there any program that catched the parts of the sample you already looked at, kind of like Google Earth would back in the day? What program? Like the program that you're using. I told him that the program is what came with the equipment. It is, using. yes. I'm not... Uh, it's, it's part of the software package that's just part of the SEM. So oh. it's a proprietary software produced by Tescan. The program keeps a cache of the, like a topographic map of the stuff as a whole, if that's what you're asking. Well, the images that we're collecting are effectively topographic in nature, um, but it does not include like X, Y, Z, um, information for each pixel or anything like that. Um, but the, you know, the image that we're looking at is fundamentally topographic in nature. In other words, we're just seeing the surface. We're not seeing through the samples. I really have no idea what this diatom is. Um, it looks like it belongs with, uh, the, the valve ends or the Rafi ends are very interesting. Um, like this one, it stops right here. So the Rafi goes from here to here and then it stops. And then there's a really broad area with no Rafi at all through the middle of the diatom. And still no Rafi. And then the Rafi returns here. So it's one of these diatoms that has really short, um, really, really short uh, rafies that don't go all the way to the middle of the diatom, but it's quite large. I mean, this is uh, oh. a pretty large diatom. I'm not leaving you hanging, hang, Yon. I just want to make sure you three. can um, Yon's asked, when are the vaccines going to be rolled out in Indiana? They are already rolling out vaccines in Indiana. You just um, have to be eligible. Correct. Right now, it's like 65 and older, so I don't qualify for that yet. Um, uh, but. Um, and healthcare workers. Healthcare workers already got theirs, fortunately. But they're eligible as well. Yeah, they're eligible. Um, and they're starting with the oldest population. So they did like healthcare workers and also people in. Um, in uh, uh, like um, assisted living or like old people uh, homes. What do they call those places? Retirement homes. Retirement homes. So they've started with those. It's my chair. Um, <laughs> yeah, so those have been, um, they've already started with those. I'm going to get a nice high resolution image of this one because it's really cool. Probably a new species. Um, R, R blah, blah, blah says, I'm assuming that this sample was taken from a water, from a water body. If so, how is the collected sample cleaned of contaminants or other foreign objects? So it was collected from a core. Um, the the core is sort of a metal cylinder or plastic tube that gets pushed down into the sediment. And then um, they have a piston that keeps the sediment from falling out of the tube when they pull it back out. Um, you have this sort of long column of sediment. And then uh, the core was subsampled from the mud um, that was pulled up and uh, and then sent to me in little baggies. So um, when we process samples for diatoms, we are mostly looking to get rid of the um, things that might block our field of view. So there's a lot of mud and we wanna to try to reduce the mud. You can see there's mud all over um, 
the field of view still in this one, but they're clumps of mud together. So I had Mallory rinse them a few times to get rid of the little particles. Most of the little particles of mud have been removed, but they're still sort of clumps uh, that we need to break down a little bit further. Um, but our normal processing technique for uh, samples that we want to analyze on light microscope or scanning electron microscope is to process them using nitric acid. So um, we start with the mud, we put it in a beaker or a vial, and uh, we weigh it, and then we um, add nitric acid. Uh, the other thing that we often will add is um, hydrogen peroxide to them. So the combined components of those will usually get rid of all organic matter. And um, the sort of clay particles we can't really get rid of very easily, especially if they're clumped together like this. Um, so detrital components that are mostly clay are still in the samples. So I'm going to go ahead and get a nice high resolution. It'll take 10 minutes for that picture to work its way ten out. 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes. Oh my. Yum. I too blame the EU for everything that happens. I don't exactly understand the EU, but... Um, it's the easiest thing to do? Yeah, this sample's from the bottom of the core, so it's about seven meters um, into the sediment. Um, they actually collect overlapping cores to get down to the right interval. Um, they collect as much of it as they can from one record, and yeah, as Pacific Plankton mentioned, it's about 10,000 years old. And then uh, subdivide it. I think this one, they cut it into one centimeter intervals, and then they sent us samples from every one centimeter or every 10 centimeters or something like that um, in order to analyze it. So um, yeah, I think we have samples every 10 centimeters and then uh, they dated it. Um, this was dated using radiocarbon dating. So uh, materials that, organic materials that are in the core like uh, little twigs or sticks or bits of leaves or charcoal can be used to, uh, to date. Yeah. Oh, it's I okay. <laughs> We're taking a picture. I can just put Mallory in charge and come talk to you. No, it's not a deal. Okay. Well, I know how to entertain the masses. <laughs> no, I'm True. We have a thousand viewers. That's awesome. So, or followers, I should say. So That's we're awesome. wearing party. Oh, I'm wearing party hat. Mallory took hers off. I wondered whose birthday it was. It's nobody's birthday. <laughs> we're just celebrating. Awesome. Now we have a thousand and six viewers. Cool. So. Thank you, MDS one one six one. Darn it! Ah, thank you for joining the Diatom Army. I hope you can hear me. These are Lake Isabel samples that we're looking at right now. Very so. cool. Yeah. So, you're following what's being streamed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she's handling the chat for me okay. and then because I am busy with the scanning electron microscope normally and then now it's taking a picture so I can actually kind of see what's going on and most of the time I just have the scanning electron microscope stream up mm -hmm. so like this is what I'm seeing and then I can't see the actual comments so she sort of helps me out by reading okay. them to me but um, oh I was gonna look up what I think this thing is I think it's a Berkeley eye Ber Berkeley eye something like that I need to look it up. It it's a diatom I've never seen before. Oh, maybe it's no Bravisonia. Is that right? I don't think so. The stride don't come all the way across. Probably. I feel like it starts with a B. <laughs> Ugh. Well, I had just come in to ask if you have a surge protector for this. Uh, it's plugged into a surge protector, but not like a UPS system. Okay. Because if it wasn't, I was going to buy one. We probably should get a UPS system for it, okay. but um, but it has a surge outlet protector. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Uh, is C14 data still reliable with all the radioactive pollution? Uh, that's, I don't think the decay of carbon is dependent on. Sure it is. How? Uh, what happens is radioactivity in the upper atmosphere actually causes, um, let's see, a surplus of um, carbon-13, carbon-14, sorry. Um, oh! So like this, what's called this, there's a couple of effects that actually come into play, um, but radiocarbon dating from 1950s forward is not very reliable. Um, and in fact, anything from sort of like 1900 forward uh, is got an influence of something called the Seuss effect, which is that we started burning Seuss fossil fuel, like Dr. Seuss. I thought you said Seuss effect. I was like, Seuss? Not Seuss. Seuss. Like Dr. Seuss. Uh, the Seuss effect is essentially we started burning um, fossil fuels, and that introdu introduces a bunch of dead carbon into the upper atmosphere. And so um, that has an influence on anything that you might try to date. Like if, um, if I died and then they wanted to date my skeleton, um, like how old am I, then um, the carbon that I'm taking up has that interchange with the atmosphere. And um, so uh, the Seuss effect would come into play because we're burning a bunch of fossil fuels today, which are putting dead carbon into the atmosphere. But if we're looking at something that's 10,000 years old, um, there's no way that a stick from 10,000 years that's been buried in the mud um, could be affected by um, atmospheric exchange today because organisms when they die stop taking up carbon dioxide and as a result they stop putting carbon from the atmosphere into their bodies and as a result there's no exchange so um, you can take a stick from 10,000 years old and um, you can um, measure the amount of radiocarbon that's left in it and it'll be completely reliable. So there's no, um, there's no way once an organism dies for it to sort of create a high level of carbon exchange with the atmosphere. And as a result, you're not gonna get any sort of like impact of bombs or radio, uh, radiocarbon um, or dead carbon from fossil fuels affecting something that's 10,000 years old. Um, if you were to look at something from 1950s forward, you'd have to have um, a special calibration done based on the bomb effects and also the Seuss effect. And um, usually we don't date things with radiocarbon in that sort of a short window. Instead, we use something else, which is lead 210 dating to date something that's like less than about 150 years old. So um, you could look forward uh, with radiocarbon dating from 1950 um, forward but um, most typically, if we were gonna date something that's that young, we would use instead um, lead 210 or cesium-137. We don't typically use radiocarbon from 1950s forward. Um, uh, other than sometimes people will use the bomb signals themselves um, for spikes in radiocarbon. But, um, but it won't have any influence on ancient carbon. So um, all the carbon, <laughs> Radiocarbon dating is based on the decay of carbon-14 um, back to nitrogen-14. And so the amount of radiocarbon that we could detect won't have any, um, won't have any, you know, like things that happen today won't happen, won't have any influence on dating something that's ancient. Um, and the reliability of radiocarbon dating is usually within, um, uh, within an error window of typically 100 or 150 years. So when I say 10,000 years, it's, you know, it's probably 10,000 plus or minus 150. Um, but depending on where, um, when the sample was uh, collected, um, there can be some variance in the error associated with it based on changes in productivity of carbon-14 in the upper, upper atmosphere. So, um, you, you can have some influence of changing productivity of carbon in the upper atmosphere in radiocarbon dating, but um, we have a new follower. Thank you. Uh, but um, any um, changes that we've observed from those can usually be calibrated to um, things that have continuous records. 
So um, if we wanted to, for example, uh, figure out the age of something that's 10,000 years old, we could compare it with corals that are 10,000 years old that we can count um, the actual incremental annual bands of growth from um, those organisms. So if it grows every year, like a tree or coral or uh, cave deposits or, um, or lake records, like varves or ice, um, ice cores sometimes have uh, laminations that are annual, seasonal. Um, we can actually count those back and then we could take samples from those, date the material that's 10,000 years old in that record and see what is the reliability of that information. So um, this is a good question, um, but the scientists are very careful about um, radiocarbon dating and also reporting the reliability of the dates that they get. So uh, I'm so confused by what this thing could possibly be, and I don't even have a name for it. It belongs with the Frustrulia frickia amphiplura group, but um, it's not what I thought it would be, which is maybe Bravisonia. Uh, there's something that's like this that has like a little tiny raphe. I just can't think of the name of it. It's like a genus I've never seen before. Um, it doesn't mean nobody's ever seen it before. It just means it's like, you know, there are some... Um, freshwater genera that are rare that I just haven't seen and I'm actually trying to figure out what it is. Um, Demon Plasma said congrats on the 1k follows. Also got my stickers in the mail the other day. Thanks. Great. And then Yon's asked if it was a new species. Um, I said not exactly. It probably is. Um, I don't know. I feel like it belongs with Amphiplura, and there's, it does not look like Pellucida to me, um, but I'm just gonna call it Amphiplura-like. Jan said, if a new species is discovered on stream, I want dibs on it being named after me. Let me tell you what, Jan. In terms of naming, I am owed too many good funny names that I have made up. And by too many, I mean like one or two. I don't know what you mean by ode. I, I am sick of naming things reasonably and in a way that makes sense. I want them to have no sensical meaning. I want it to be just random letters and noises, kind of like Grimes and Elon Musk's kid. Um, I think they have a pronunciation for that. But... Isn't it like uh, Adam or something? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, you know I don't follow celebrity news. We should name it, well, listen, listen, listen. If it's a new species, you should just name it Amphiflora and then like Jonathan. Why Jonathan? I don't know. Can you imagine having like... Okay. Like all of the, all new species from this point on should be given like really... Like We're just going to call this names. one Rebecca. Yes. Star of Cyber Rebecca. This is actually a, uh, a phytolith that we're looking at, right? That's not a diatom. It's kind of a cool looking one. <laughs> Asterum, Asteromophallus Paul. Paul. Yeah, Tommy. Tommy. Theodore. Alvin, Simon, Theodore. No, you're not doing chipmunks. <laughs> is that where you draw the line? That is where I draw the line. The chipmunks and the Bee Gees. No. The Bee Gees are really good. That's no. not even like, you're just being grumpy about it. I am They're not. Really good. I draw a line. Guys, a line is drawn. And okay. You come to me on a summer breeze. No, you're going to be thrown out of the lab if you keep it up. Sorry. You know this. All right, uh, I'm going to actually jump over to the next sample up. I was going to do that like a half hour ago, and then I got distracted by. I don't know, a new genus, whatever that is. Um, this is actually another sample uh, that I was really curious to see what was going on with because when I looked at it in the light microscope, I found a bunch of these little round guys and none of the benthic diatoms that we had been seeing. And these little round guys right here, this thing is, I believe, Thalassocyra. And what's interesting about that is we moved up a half meter in the core 
and Thalassia syra, Thalassia syra. If I zoom around, you see a bunch of little round things in the sample. Uh, these are girdle bands from Thalassia syra. And then these little balls that are seeing right here are actually uh, microsphere particles that we put in for counting purposes. Um, but that's Thalassia syra. This is a piece of a Thalassia syra. And one of the things that's really interesting about this, so that's a sponge spicule right there. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about this is all of the benthic diatoms that we were seeing in the previous slide are now gone, and they've been replaced by Thalassia syra. So, um, you know, I don't know what species of Thalassia syra it is, and in fact, I was struggling to find a, um, a good representative um, that's not dissolved. So they're all a little dissolved. Um, what's curious, there's a bunch of things that's really curious about this for me, which is, of course, First, um, we don't have a lot of benthic diatoms. Here's one, just one in this sample. Um, Frecht chemist has a question. Oh, Frecht chemist, we had the, we had the micro manipulator and you weren't here for that part. Um, but I can take it, I can show it to him again. Um, her question is, if I gave you some diatomaceous earth and you looked under the microscope, could you identify where it's from? Interesting you asked that. Probably. Uh, if I looked at it in the scanning electron microscope, I could figure out the genera. And I could probably not only tell you where it's from, but I could probably tell you when it's from. Um, and I could probably tell you a little bit about the environment where um, those diatoms lived at the time. So again, we're seeing just like a, a valve face of a diatom. It's one of these round ones. Again, I think it's the last is Syrah. Um, and so what's cool is the last sample was all benthic, and this sample is mostly planktonic diatoms or planktic diatoms, and it means that there's been a change in our system. And um, this is something that I observed in the light microscope, so it's not surprising to me, but um, I was really trying to see if I could figure out what species of the Lassiosyra we have, and I don't know that that's gonna be possible because our sample's all full of dissolved diatoms. So, What's cool, we went from mostly benthic diatoms to having a bunch of planktic diatoms. And not only that, so that tells us that we went from shallow water to deep water um, in order to do that. We drowned all of the bottom stuff so it's no longer in the light. And now we have a bunch of stuff that floats in the water rather than stuff that lives on the bottom. And so over that time span, which is about maybe 2,000 or 3,000 years from the previous sample to this one, the lake has gone from something shallow and slightly acidic and filled with plants to something that's basically too deep for plants to grow in, dominated by planktic diatoms. And also, the Lassiosyra is a very special type of diatom because it also um, only grows in, um, in brackish or marine conditions. And so um, we know that this lake is close to the coast and we know that at least today, sometimes it gets in inundated with seawater um, when there's, you know, flooding events. And so um, what we think probably happened here is that we had a shallow sort of bog system and um, a few thousand years later, we suddenly have this sample where instead of having um, benthic diatoms, we have deeper water. We have a bunch of marine or brackish water conditioned species that are present. And another characteristic um, aspect of this is, you know, we saw what the samples looked like we didn't have a lot of dissolved diatoms in the previous sample, but most of the Thalassia syra are dissolved. And in order to dissolve silica, you have to have pH values that are typically above nine and fairly warm temperatures. So um, what this suggests is not, that the, not just that the same site that we were looking at before is now deeper, a little bit more salty, but it also went from what we would assume to be something that was kind of um, acidic to something that we see here as being salty and alkaline because it's dissolving diatoms. And the easiest way to explain that, um, that you went from something shallow to something deep, and in the process it got saltier and more alkaline, is actually to suggest that probably we're looking at a, um, an incursion of marine conditions into the, um, the lake system. So what used to be a lake now is flooded with ocean water, um, which is more alkaline and has a uh, much saltier, more saline conditions. 
and um, we can tell that just from the diatoms. So um, what's cool about the sample is there's not really much of a transition. It's not like it goes shallow, slightly deeper, slightly deeper, slightly deeper. It starts shallow, and then the next sample that we look at, it's maybe, you know, uh, if I were to go to the sample that's just below this in the core, um, it would be still shallow water conditions. And then this sample, suddenly it's deep water, it's salty, and it's got a bunch of alkalinity in it that didn't occur in the previous samples. And that suggests to us that we had a marine flooding event in this lake system where um, either there was a storm or, um, or potentially sea levels were higher very rapidly. So that's kind of cool. And I um, really wish I could find a Thalassiosira that wasn't totally dissolved so that we could try to figure out what species it is. Did you have questions from chat? I did, but it was answered off anyway. Can diatoms adapt to They, for the most part, diatoms um, live in either freshwater or salt water. Um, but there are some diatoms, for example, like the Lassiosira, that can live in brackish conditions. So um, sometimes I get samples on here from uh, San Francisco Bay, from uh, Pacific Plankton's collection. And they have the Lassiosira in them because, and they're sometimes dominated by the Lassiosira because the Lassiosira can handle marine conditions, but um, it's an estuary type and system and it gets fresh water that flows into it. And so um, there are diatoms that are basically well adapted to uh, what we call schizohaline conditions, the conditions where the salinity fluctuates very rapidly. And, um, and, uh, and Thalassiosira is one of those. And so probably what we're seeing is a, um, a marine incursion into this lake system where this Thalassiosira species is able to bloom or potentially, um, you know, these could have been carried in from the ocean all the way to um, this lake system, which is several kilometers upstream of, um, of the ocean. Um, so they may be, uh, they may not have lived in the system at all. They might have just been brought in with a pulse of water uh, from the ocean and uh, changed the water chemistry and also the, the depth of the lake settings. So that's a kind of a cool story. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to identify this thing from, uh, from this kind of a, um, a fossil other than just to genus, I think it probably is just the Thalassiosira, but even that's kind of a struggle because we can't see any of the internal characteristics of the diatom. So I'm gonna take like a low res, high speed image of this. And um, so I have one, but until I find an actual like well-preserved Thalassiosira, uh, I probably can't put a species name on it and maybe not even a genus name. Yeah, well, I think even if you're on a boat, uh, it's probably not a good thing to be around. Um, but um, one of the things that's interesting, of course, is it's decimated all of the diatoms that we saw in that system um, from before, which were freshwater diatoms. Those ones would die, uh, and any fish in the water probably would die, um, and a lot of the other organisms that are present, uh, microorganisms included, a lot of them are what we call stenohaline, which means they, um, they like a specific salinity. They don't like to have their salinity modified very much. And um, if, you, if you have a fish tank, you're probably familiar with this idea. You can't just take your tropical marine fish and stick it in a freshwater system. It kills them instantly. Um, so this uh, uh, issue for organisms is that they have a hard time making rapid adjustments to salinity. Um, it's one of the things that um, organisms have difficulty with. It's called osmoregulation. And osmoregulation is the ability to basically adjust to changes in um, concentrations of salts. So um, for fish, it's very challenging for them to osmoregulate. And um, it's not just fish, any organism that lives in those conditions. There's very few organisms that can handle like this sort of urihaline or polyhaline uh, changes in salinity um, where they can just manage to persist through um, the material no matter um, what the salinity is. And diatoms, some diatoms are highly sensitive to that. They're, um, they're stenohaline. 
Um, so they like freshwater conditions or they like marine conditions. And then there's a few of them like this Thalassia syra um, that probably could handle rapid changes in salinity fairly well. Um, there's some other diatoms that are similar to this that I would expect to see if it were blooming um, in the system, like Cyclotella striata, Cyclotella meniginiana, something in that realm where they can kind of handle or really do really well in, um, in fluctuating salinity conditions. It does look a little bit like a cracker. And Sarah also wants to know how old these are. This sample in um, in that setting uh, is around. Uh, I don't want to ruin the story for the publication that we're working on. Oh, don't tell them. But um, around eight thousand years uh, old, so about two thousand years younger than the previous sample that we looked at, or so. Um, but uh, this is a paper that we are currently. Um, it's been reviewed, and we just have to make some changes to it, and then I think it will be accepted in geology. So um, that's where we're trying to publish the story um, about this sort of marine incursion. Um, what's interesting is if you look at the samples that are above this one in the record, um, which we, we can do, um, and I'm probably going to jump over there because I'm not finding a lot of Thalassia syra um, that are clearly evident in the sample that are well-preserved. So I'm going to jump to the next sample up, um, this sample is about 20 centimeters higher than the one that we're in, so it's pretty close in terms of time. Um, it's probably still like uh, 8,000 or maybe at most 7,000 years ago. Um, but you can see uh, there's, again, not a lot of um, diatoms visible. But the ones that we find in it um, from the light microscope, this is a girdle view of it. This is another diatom that's common in marine systems or um, sometimes in borderline marine systems. Is that a fire alarm? It is a fire alarm. We have a fire alarm going on. It went off yesterday too. I don't yeah, know. sometimes when they're working on the roof, uh, they hit the fire alarm by accident. So I don't think we're on fire, but I guess you could check in case. We don't want to. Well, what am I gonna do? Go put it out with my hands? No, but you can tell me whether or not we're gonna die in a fire if I stay well, here. Last time the sirens did come, so. Uh, the diatom that we're looking at currently, just ignore the fire alarm. No big deal. Is uh, terpsino. Uh, terpsino is really interesting diatom. Um, she left the door open so that I could hear the fire alarm running. Typical. Uh, Trip Snow is really interesting diatom name. Trip Snow. Uh, last words of Dr. Stone. Ah, ignore the fire alarm. Mr. Bucks wasn't in any hurry. Okay. So, I don't think we should be. Uh, he did leave. So. Hey, you kids, you left the door open. Uh,. Like made eye contact with me, we stared at each other, and he just turned around the corner and left. I was like, All right, okay. <laughs> like, here's go. another piece of a terpsino. Uh, here's another piece of terpsino, terpsino, and uh, this whole sample is basically filled with fragments of terpsino. And this little round thing, what is it? Um, Oh, it's the Thalassia syra. So we're still in marine settings. I moved up about 20 centimeters, except for now, instead of being dominated by um, uh, plankton in the form of uh, Thalassia syra, we're actually seeing a bunch of, um, oh, we're seeing a bunch of terpsino. And then that is an Olica syra. So um, a, a freshwater organism mixed together with um, a plankton, mixed together with some marine or brackish water uh, plankton, and, um, and also these large fragments of terpsino everywhere. And as I mentioned, terpsino is a uh, marine 
uh, or organism that lives on the bottoms. Hey, the fire alarm stopped. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is kind of an interesting mixture of some freshwater organisms and some marine organisms together and um, conditions that are also uh, borderline between fresh and salty and borderline between deep and, uh, and shallow. So we're in a sort of like a weird mixing place. And I think that this is probably representative of um, some of the marine system, the marine salts staying in the lake system. And then um, we get a freshwater uh, pulse coming into the lake and um, seasonally, probably, that's filled with um, freshwater diatoms. So this is sort of a cool story. We can get the marine organisms and the freshwater organisms in the same sample. And I think that's because basically we're just getting um, a, a kind of a, just like a complete mixture of those two environments as um, freshwater uh, lenses get sort of carried out onto the surface of this um, lake system that uh, was temporarily, at least, um, like a little mini ocean. Um, so it has some benthic and planktic organisms that we would expect in marine settings, and then uh, just a few freshwater organisms that can handle, um, uh, can't handle high salinities, but, um, but potentially could have been carried in by streams or flowing water. Um, so maybe a river or something carried them in, and, um, and then fresh water would float on top of uh, salty water because it has a lower density. And uh, diatoms might be able to live in that little lens of fresh water uh, for short periods of time. And then uh, it would either evaporate or it would mix eventually with um, some of that salty water. And um, so we have this weird, interesting mix of um, freshwater diatoms and marine diatoms in the same setting. Um, but my guess is they're probably separated seasonally. Like we probably see like a, a wet season, dry season kind of a signal where we're getting both of them together in that same system. Now above this, if I looked at the light microscope uh, materials, um, for basically um, the next three meters of the core, the diatoms are all dissolved and there's basically no record of them. And I would assume that that is the case because the alkalinity is still very high and the diatoms are largely dissolved in those intervals. And so here's a nice picture of a terpseno. The valve face is broken off of it a little and we're looking in the inside of the diatom. Um, but I am gonna try to get a picture of this because I wanted to try to figure out which species of terpseno it was to see if that could help us figure out um, uh, what uh, the water conditions are like like how saline is it because um, I think maybe that would help so I'm gonna rotate it and um, and move it to the middle so terpsino are characterized by these really thick uh, valve skeletons and they have sort of an undulating shape to them on the margin um, really cool looking diatoms um, when you see them perfectly preserved, there's usually a big rima portula and, um, and these ends on the valve face, if we had this thing flipped over so we weren't looking into it, but rather we're looking at the surface of it. Um, so for this view, we're on the inside of the cell itself, um, but we would, um, we would see a celly on the ends and they're really too big to be plankton. So we know that they live in the, um, on the bottoms of um, water bodies on the, on the sort of uh, sediment floor. And uh, they like elevated salinities and alkalinities typically. So um, trying to figure out which species it is would be potentially instrumental for us to try to figure out like how saline is it? Um, you know, how, what sort of salinities are we talking about? Because um, some diatoms are capable of actually giving us that kind of information. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they probably did get a surprise and uh, not the good kind. So uh, not like a 1,000 viewer uh, follower surprise party party uh, <laughs> surprise, but... More like a funeral. 
Yeah. Yeah. More like a funeral. Well, all of us, but... Not everybody gets a funeral. Really? Some people get their ashes scattered. What is your, like, desired funeral? Oh, I just want to be uh, incinerated. Really? Yeah. I'm ready for that. (laughs) Wait, you're ready for it now? You don't even want (laughs) to see it to the end? Today I'm pretty ready for it, but... uh, I would like to wait it out, I think. Yeah, you think? Or you just <laughs> want to hop in? I don't, I don't, wanna, on I don't want to be incinerated today. I think we addressed that earlier with the fire alarm a little bit. I mean, you kind of did. The way you didn't react at all. Like, I even had a somewhat of a desire to go outside. And I was here yesterday. Diet uh, Wake. This is it. So this is a nice, cool diet tom. Usually they're a lot big, bigger than um, everything around them. Uh, Terpsino can be enormous diatoms. Uh, I think they can be hundreds of microns in size. So this one's kind of a little guy, an old one. Um, hopefully that will help me figure out what species it is. And uh, hopefully I can tell enough just from the outline. I think these are Terpsino musica, but um, but I, um, I'm not positive. So the shape is maybe a little wrong for musica. Uh, the valve ends are usually a little knobbier, but um, but I don't know the size series very well to say for sure. Um, but it would be nice to be able to put a name on it, and then I could go, okay, this is definitely marine or or maybe estuarian uh, type salinities. Yeah, thanks for putting that link up. I'm actually looking at that link on my other page uh, of Pacific. Not that you could see it, but um, of the Terpsino. One of the things that's kind of neat, uh, you probably wouldn't think it, but this is actually a centric diatom. Uh, in the, what I mean by that is um, uh, usually when we say centric diatoms, we're talking about diatoms without a raphe, which this one does not have and also diatoms that are usually round, but some of the centric diatoms have, uh, so they're separated by whether or not they are bilaterally symmetrical or whether they are radially symmetrical. But Terpsino, despite its shape, is um, actually radially symmetrical. So uh, I think if you started here in the middle and you, um, you, uh, because of the weird shape, we would think it's bilaterally symmetrical, but it actually belongs with the the centric diatoms. So um, it's in the order of It's uh, It's um, similar to sort of the linear looking marine diatoms. And again, most of the Bedolphia are um, marine diatoms, which is why I'm not familiar with most of the species. So. Do they make good musical instruments? Yes, they do actually. Do diatoms um, or who? Yes, diatoms. Or fire alarms? Fire alarms make fantastic musical instruments. You know theremins? Yeah. Well, of course, because open set plays the theremin. Yeah. Yeah. If, I think I would listen to fire alarms a lot more if they were like theremin noises or like classical music, because then I'd have a reason to want to get out. You know, if I just hear a fire alarm... I have a feeling they don't want to make the fire alarms pleasant. But listen, that if they were pleasant, I would have a reason to want to get up and walk out, because I'd be like, I kind of want to hear this again. I want to hear that song? I want I want to hear music like You'd have that. a reason to pull the fire alarm, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. You imagine if it was the most beautiful noise in the world, like every day, someone pulled the fire alarm. It was like the boy who cried wolf, but... I don't think... Uh, and like... It's these sort of deep philosophical questions we've been missing without Mallory around mm-hmm. to ask them. I knew it. I'll keep giving them, don't worry. Oh, I'm not worried. I have no fear of that. So uh, this diatom that we're looking at currently belongs to the genus Oligocyra. And Oligocyra make these sort of beer can shaped bodies uh, that are linked together with spines. And this one has little triangle shaped spines that are inner fingered. And I don't like the uh, the image quality. Oh, well, somebody subscribed. Bob or WCC gifted a tier one community sub. sub. Sam Sean. All right. TV. Thanks, Bobber. Thank you, Bobber. That's so sweet. 
you know what Jan said? Replace the fire alarm with staying alive by the Bee Gees. Oh, that would make me get out. I probably would also smash it on the way out. He would fly out of the building. I probably you would. would. understand how much he does not like the Bee Gees. I probably would smash it on the way out. I would be like, this stupid thing. Okay, I'm going to try... This is why all my pictures weren't great. The wobble. I need to start by doing the wobble instead of waiting until it's too late. Hey, if I... Hear me out. Hear me out. You haven't even started. Okay. If I go into... Singing. Think about it. How gray do you think I'd do? How am I supposed to answer this question? Like on a scale of 1 to 10? Or... Um, Britney Spears, how successful would I be on a scale of one to ten? Well, if you're already Britney Spears, I would say you're quite successful. No, the next Britney Spears. That's what I'm saying. No, the next. The only way to be Britney Spears is to already be successful. Oh, Pacific Plankton said it should be another one bites the dust. But staying alive would be better because of the thing. And then if, you know, the firemen have to do any, the, the, the beautiful, handsome firemen have to do any, like, chest compressions they have the 100 bpm to work with you know that's a good point that looks like a string of carpet sorry i'm fixing the wobble oh it looks like a string of carpet that's what the wobble was wrong alpha bio wanted you to know alpha bio is that like a play on alpha beta omega so it's a good thing and now i'm going to try to fix the Stigmation. That's <laughs> so practical. Yeah, Jans. Do they, what do you call firemen in Belgium? Please share with the class. Say it out loud, I'll hear you. Oh, I feel like the picture quality has improved substantially by me Wait, futzing phone. around with Is little things, blocked? but. Boom, boom, ready. The picture looks better. It's just, it looks better. Boom. Three o'clock. It's my bedtime. I'm sorry? Do I remember when the wobble was a dance? I don't know dance crazes, Sarah. Um, Dude, I definitely remember every single dance I ever went to in high school. They call them Brondweer? Bron uh, what? I think that's what the answer was for firemen. Pompiers? Brondweer. That's French. Did I pronounce it correctly? You guys, that, that doesn't have the same, like, coolness as fireman. Brondweer? Brondweer sounds kind of silly. No offense to your Brondweers. How do you plural, how do you, like, pluralize Brondweer? How do we make Here's plurals in... Just add an S. I don't That's think... That's how you do it in English. Or you add an ES. It depends. Or like you go from from moose to uh, to also moose. <laughs> <laughs> or fish to also fish. No, fi well, yeah, you go from fish to fish unless it's like different kinds of fish. Yeah, fishes. right. Mind of a snail says it looks like a hair curler. That's a great observation. It looks exactly like a hair curler. Uh, the old-fashioned kind that ladies would wear, you know, with the curl up in your hair. I was going to buy one for my bangs, but then I did not. Um, I did not. It was going to be a big chubby one. Chubby bangs? Well, I didn't want them to be like... I just wanted them to be like... Should I put in the beauty and hair care tag again? You knew I was going to be here today, so yeah, you should have. Um, I debated putting the ASMR on. Because then you, then probably be too irritating to people. You're like probably should. I could put an ASMR because it's like visual ASMR. Yeah. Where's the oh this? Yeah. Kinda. No, it definitely if is. Took, like, if you took one of those uh And then I've got the white noise. If you took and a then my golden voice. Picture, and then I've got this thing. I I did it through my mask that I time. I hate that you did it through your mask. <laughs> a long picture where it was just like slowly moving down, then the end of it would be like, oh, 
<laughs> knock them all out with the white noise yeah. and my golden voice and the occasional. Oh my God, they don't like those. <laughs> They're too loud. They don't like it. This is painful. <laughs> really? Yeah. And you just kept doing it. You're like, oh, really? <laughs> Brand it's... equals fire. We are equals resist. So it's not really an individual firefighter. You can say oh. Brand Weirman or Brand Weir. See, well, listen, I had a speech impediment, so I can't say that. For male or female fighters. Okay. Well, we have fire person now. Oh, well, we do? Well, I just, fireman is like a colloquial, I don't know. I call anyone who, like, has on the outfit a fireman. I can't, you know, tell the difference behind their little mask. I can't believe they didn't like my ASMR noisemaker. Yeah, yeah, they didn't. I, you want me to read exactly what they said? No. Damn, that was loud. Oh, God, that's awful. That's painful. Please don't. Stop. That's bad. Did that raise your self-esteem? No. No? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, you didn't think about it for the next, like, four days. I don't really care about yeah. self-esteem. Really? Nah. If you could rate how much self-esteem you had on a scale of 1 to 10, where would it be? I would say 11 for myself, unfortunately. I don't know. I don't think about stuff like that. Look at this cool spine on this thing, though. Looks like a rice for, you know orzo? Orzo, I know orzo. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly. a type of pasta, so of course I know it. Yeah, I know what it is too, because I actually did a, my dissertation on pasta. Um, what? Yeah. Well, after my dissertation on space snail, the history of space snails. Oh boy. Please tell us about SEM as much as possible. I have an exam on it soon. Would appreciate it. You have an I'll exam be, on SEM? I'll be helping you cheat on your. Well, I guess it's not cheating. That's your course material. They just sent the. The block the of SEM text. Command. Yeah. <laughs> um. Do well, I have these uh, hotkeys, but they aren't working. Uh, oh, this one works. No, oh, that's weird. No. No? No. Is it necessary to getting a job? Maybe. I don't know. You I mean, I have a job. You do, but you don't use LinkedIn. No. Okay. But I did not use LinkedIn for my job either. Okay. Look at that cool spine. It's super weird. You can buy rice to make risotto. I want rice so bad. I miss the dining hall. Like vegetarian meals, they were pretty gosh darn good. I miss that. I don't think so. You don't miss it. You never experienced it. How can you? But you know what's even better than that? I have a wife who makes vegetarian meals for me all the time. That's true. And I'm gonna guess she does a better job than she, you know, a she dining hall. She probably does. I can say that with you know. Actually, I'm gonna say definitely. I never make definite statements, but I will make a definite statement on this one. It's probably a higher quality and better taste. This week I've been making them though, so. Oh. Man. What's this big round thing? Electron microscopy in general. I study material science. La warmness. So, um, I don't know if I can help you with your exam, but I will tell you that, um, you know, I do have these figures. So, like, these classic figures. You have an electron gun at the top. You have a, in my case, a tungsten filament, and uh, it creates a plasma cloud of electrons. And then uh, these are pulled downward by a positively charged anode and um, down into a series of magnets, which will focus the beam. They pass down onto the sample where they interact with the specimen and then they are collected by a secondary detector, which has a positive charge, and also then um, photoactivated cell in here. So when electrons hit it, they uh, uh, cause the um, material to be brighter or dimmer. So the more electrons that hit it, the brighter it gets. Um, if we look into the actual specimen that's hit by the electron beam, then we have this sort of bulb-shaped interaction, and 
electrons that are coming in will actually bounce off of the surface. These are called Auger electrons. Um, some of them will also then penetrate into the material and they will displace electrons. The electrons that are ejected out when they interact with the electrons that are beaming in are um, fired back out of the sample and these are called the secondary electrons and they create this topographic information that is then collected by our secondary detectors. So secondary electrons are detected by secondary detectors and they, um, they give us topographic information because the more tilted you are towards the sensor, the brighter that image is and the more tilted away from the sensor, the darker that image is because fewer electrons will make its way to the sensor um, in that case. So um, essentially you're getting a topographic bit of information by how close um, or, uh, or rather how, how more tilted towards the sensor or away from the sensor that material is. And when it scans across there, basically um, if a lot of electrons make it to the sensor, then you get a bright dot and then it just draws that pixel by pixel as it moves across. Some of the electrons are also penetrate a little more deeply and they will interact with um, uh, those um, materials that are your specimen, and then they will be um, backscattered from them. And the backscattered electrons are usually collected by a backscatter detector rather than by the secondary detector. And it's basically um, very close to the actual specimen. The beam typically goes right through the middle of it and then the, um, the backscatter detector is around it so it functions to capture those backscattered electrons. Some of the electrons that go in then also will displace electrons from um, all of the material that they're interacting with and they can penetrate into this sort of outer bulb that's down here um, uh, called uh, the x-ray continuum part or bremsstrahlung uh, interval and these ones create what's known as characteristic x-rays. And if you have an EDAX detector, which ours does, it essentially tells by which one of the, so if you have an electron of, I don't know, say uh, uranium on there, we don't have uranium on iron, or gold, um, if it knocks one out of a shell, what happens is electrons from a higher shell will move to a lower shell to create a more stable um, uh, atom and when it does that, it gives off energy. And the, um, which shell it moves from basically gives characteristic energy off. So if you have a gold and you knock something out of the D shell or uh, a lead and you knock something out of the D shell, it gives off a characteristic amount of energy depending on what kind of um, elemental um, atom it is and which shell it gets knocked out of. And if you have an EDAX detector, what it does is it looks at the X-ray energy that's coming off of there and then um, it tells you, oh, it's got this much energy. It's likely coming from this shell of this electron. And you can use that to actually tell what things are composed of. And um, when things are kind of close, like if the difference between one shell and another from one um, uh, element is similar to that same electron energy that's given off um, by x-rays, on a different one, it can't usually tell them apart. So there might be a little bit of discrepancy where it thinks it's looking at this uh, element, but it's actually looking at a different element. It's just looking at a different shell that's been displaced from it. So um, effectively, we can use that to use the interaction between the electron beam and our material to tell compositionally what is it that it's passing through or hitting and bouncing off of. Yeah. So. Um, these are the components that are going on. And um, there's another layer, which is the cathodoluminescence. Our, our SEM does not do cathodoluminescence because I don't have a cathodoluminescent detector. It was like another $20,000 that we didn't have to spend on that for the machine. Um, if you have electrons that go all the way through, those are considered transmitted electrons and they just go into the, uh, the ground here. Uh, the, the carousel itself is a ground. Um, but if you have a transmission electron microscope, that's the electrons that they primarily are collecting information from. And in uh, transmitted electron microscopes, what they do is the, um, the sensors are all on the other side of the material. And you're looking at how um, the electrons that transmit completely through the, the material, how they interact with the specimen. And that's why you get sort of a different characteristic um, signature from those than you might from, um, from a scanning electron microscope. 
So hopefully that's a, a little bit of a background. It's not going to help you with your exam, probably. You probably already know all that stuff. Um, but, um, you know, that's the general model for it. So I want to get through one last slide. Uh, we didn't actually get to the ash fall samples, but I want to just hop over to this one really quickly, which is from uh, the top of this core. And take a look at the diatoms that are present in it. And in part because there's a bunch of Olicocyra in it, um, what you'll see is that the samples are dominated by Olicocyra, again, probably representing freshwater conditions and elevated nutrients. So we've moved out of, at this point, we're way up at the top of the core, about six meters above where we were. And BIT 101, thank you for the follow. Oh, okay, we got a new follow. Um, so this sample is dominated by Olicocyra. And if we zoom in, uh, we can see a bunch of the Olicocyra. This one's in valve view. Normally they're sort of uh, soda can or beer can shaped. And um, we can get a nice clear image of it. Again, they're slightly dissolved. So uh, conditions are probably still a little bit alkaline at this point, but, um, but what we're seeing is dominantly all of the major diatoms that we're seeing, these are all Olicocyra diatoms. So there, 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 these ones are Olicocyra. And um, there's actually more than one species, I believe, because there's a little guy right here, wait for it to catch up. That looks like it's a little different species than the big one that we see um, over there. So um, probably two or more species of Olicocyra, and it would be good for me to get some images of these so I can um, try to put a name on them. The big ones up here, these ones look like um, similar to Olicocyra granulata, a common diatom in low elevations and relatively warm temperatures. I don't know if granulata is common in, um, in Guatemala, which is where these samples were collected, um, but this little guy here probably is something different. Um, it doesn't have much of the same character on the valve face as the other ones do. And also the spines are different, um, which I can tell just by looking at the material um, from the top. So I'm going to just do a real quick collection of those and then... Uh, maybe we'll have a little bit of time to jump over and look at some of the material from the Ashfall Park. Um, this is pretty, pretty critical for my, um, for my getting a species out of these Olicocyra. Usually you can figure out the species to, um, for Olicocyra in light microscope without taking it to the scanning electron microscope, but I'm curious as to whether these are actually granulata and what the little one is. Um, so I'm kind of uh, excited to see what we come up with for species names for these. Oh, it's Luan. Hello, Luan. Thank you for the congrats on a thousand followers. Um, yeah, scanning electron microscopes are great for detail. That's what you came for, the detail, hopefully. Um, this one's actually slightly blurred, and I think it's mainly because uh, I just took a slow picture, a relatively fast picture of it, I mean, because um, I just wanted to a simple view of what does the valve face look like, and I didn't spend a lot of time getting that focus clearly. So, this is. Something interesting right there as well. I don't know what's going on. Looks like maybe a dissolved diatom. That's another one of these. It does not look like granulata. Um, granulata is usually distinct, has really distinct uh, sort of heavy spines on it and um, very similar in terms of the size of the pores on the side. These are highly dissolved. So we're not getting a lot of great, even though we can get it really good detail, we can't do anything about the fact that the diatoms are kind of dissolved. 
So maybe not even worth trying to figure out uh, from these if we actually have granulata because I won't be able to see a bunch of the detail I need. Um, and this was part of the problem is like trying to figure out what you have sometimes when you just have fossil material to go by and you don't have the living organisms. Um, well, this one's pretty good actually. So it's pretty, it's very similar to granulata. Sort of square shaped pores, long spines, and uh, two rows joining each spine together, which should be a nice clue for us. I can do better. Sort of an interesting texture as well. Right in here. Um, there's some sort of like dissolution or overgrowth um, or combination of the two going on with this uh, structure, but um, you can still see the general structure of the pores being square and the, um, and the way the striae are formed. So potentially valuable. SCM colorizing that I do just comes out of my imagination. So it's just artistry, basically. Um, you know, there's, uh, I, sometimes I try to make things look kind of metal. Sometimes I try to make them look, you know, I just want to pick colors I haven't used recently. Um, diatoms are translucent. Their skeletons are made of opal, opal and silica. And so they're like glass. And so there's no real um, color, but um, if we were to look into diatoms, into the insides of them, um, they have chloroplasts and pigments, which are gold colored. Um, of course, all of that's been removed by the time that it's fossilized and then uh, processed with nitric acid and everything else that we do to um, potentially get it into a form where we could look at it. Um, but um, if we looked at the living organisms, we would see they have sort of a brownish or a gold color um, but I wouldn't want to uh, make all the diatoms the same color so um, uh, which they probably would be in real life so what I normally do is just um, pick colors that I think are pretty yeah you came to learn more about microscopy uh, well, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I talked a bit about it. Um, you know, there's a light microscopy, which I can talk a little bit more about probably when I do a home stream, uh, when I have an actual light microscope in front of me um, that I sometimes will talk about. Uh, but for this, uh, you know, scanning electron microscope work where uh, we don't use light at all. so. Um, there's no color inside the SEM. Everything that we scan is in black and white because um, it's just basically the number of electrons that are hitting our detector. So, <laughs> give you tests. I don't know what questions to ask. Uh, I teach a class on scanning electron microscopy um, occasionally, but uh, there's no test in my class. We just have projects. and. I think I'll probably teach it again in the fall. Um, I have some new grad students, and um, uh, so probably I'll make a grad class where people can learn about the SCM, how it functions, and how it interacts. And then, um, and normally I just give them projects to do. So I think for for those, we might try to have people uh, do projects that we could actually publish, which would be nice. 
um, I have students to come into a class and actually come out of it with um, potentially a publication. So. Um, for these, I don't think these pictures will make it into the publication that we are currently working on from uh, the system, but uh, maybe a subsequent publication. So um, are we looking closely at the species instead of just at the genus level and trying to interpret what we're seeing? So, uh, and potentially describing new ones. I see all these sort of um, overgrowths and weird uh, uh, silicon nodules on many of these diatoms. There's a valve face, and here's another one where we can actually see into the diatom valve. So it's kind of a cool view. Um, this structure right here is known as the ring least, another German word for people out there who are following from Germany or Belgium. Um, it's like a little um, shelf that projects inward from the margins of the diatoms. And these ones are quite thick. Um, usually those are good characterizing components when you're trying to figure out what species you're looking at. And this diatom doesn't look as badly overgrown or dissolved or whatever as the other one, but it still has some. Uh, on it. So I'm just going to do kind of a quick photo here as well um, from this view. With a nice long spine visible and the ring least visible and a nice straight stri to give us a good sense of what we might be looking at. Again, I think it's probably granulata or closely related to granulata. the audience of the chat's actually asking questions to test the, the worms. Perfect. Then I don't have to do it. Because um, testing people is okay, but grading things sucks. I like grading. I like judging others. Mallory likes the grading part. I hate the grading part. Teaching part I like, the grading part I don't. Bit 101 says that's so geometric. They are very geometric. That's a uh, good character of, of uh, see, now I've got to grade it. That's not fair. Jans, you asked the question, you've got to grade it. Or make Mallory grade it for you. That's what I do. That's awesome. As long as she's not in the class. The electrons are definitely transported away. Um, that's the whole purpose of coating things in gold, is to keep them from building up on the material. And I think he means grading. Ah, he wants you to grade the question. Depends on the energy level, I guess. There is some penetration, but it's not really deep. Electrons are also transported away since the probe is conductive uh, or made conductive. And some also scatter back. I'm not quite sure. Luckily, there is still time. So uh, a simple straight up answer is because we coat the sample in gold, and the whole point of the SEM is that the electrons bounce off and are detected within the machine, and that's what gives us this topographic, I like to call it topographic best of all map. So that's kind of the whole point of the SEM. Um, but I think we 
talked about this a while ago, that if you like point the electron beam at one point for long enough, it'll start to like degrade that area. So I mean, I guess you're right. On some level, they will eventually penetrate, I guess you could say. They always penetrate the surface a little bit. But I don't, but the, the part about the sum scatter back, um, yeah. I think you're safer just bringing up the fact that it's coated in gold. Or tungsten. No, not tungsten. What is the other thing we coated in? Silver sometimes. Really any metal. Hmm. Would any other material be better than gold? Well, um, it depends on what you're trying to do. So my immediate answer is... Gold is very conductive, and so you probably want high levels of conductivity because you're trying to get rid of the electrons from building up. Um, but I would also say that sometimes you're looking for gold in your sample, so under those conditions you probably wouldn't want to use gold to cover your material. So that's why we have uh, silver targets. So sometimes people use carbon, sometimes they'll use um, uh, copper. So there's a bunch of options for metals, especially, that you can use to coat over materials. So um, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time looking through some of these ashfall sites so I could talk a little bit about ashfall. Ooh, that's a cool looking diatom. Um, so these are some materials that were sent to me by uh, my former student, Joe Mohan. And they're collected from a site called Ashfall State Park in Nebraska, which is where uh, during the Miocene, there was a volcanic eruption and they captured a bunch of the ash that fell from that volcanic eruption. And it got trapped in um, what they think was a watering hole. And um, so the ash is preserved in this sort of uh, layers and also where they found the layers, um, they, um, they found a bunch of like baby rhinoceroses and adult rhinoceroses and uh, camels and turtles and other things that are common from the Miocene. But um, particularly interesting is the rhinoceroses. And, um, you know, so for North, it's in North America, so it's an ancient uh, environment. And um, when they looked at the bones of the rhinoceros, what they saw is they had some degradation, like they had been breathing um, ash materials for a while. And the idea is that the animals were all migrating basically to where this watering hole was. And in the process, were breathing all of the ash that was falling out of the atmosphere at the time during these volcanic eruptions. And they had some persistent um, like respiratory issues that probably developed from breathing the ash that were um, represented in their bones themselves. The cool part about it is that um, these ashfall sites where the little watering holes were that they were, uh, they were found, also because they're water sites, they contain diatoms. And so um, my former student, Joe, he, uh, he tried to use a heavy liquid separation technique to get rid of some of the ash and try to extract the diatoms that were visible, um, that were present in the material from um, some of these heavily ash uh, sort of intervals. And so we, we had a little diatom on our first field of view and a couple of other little diatoms that were present here. Um, but I need to spend some time probably looking around at these and see, um, you know, what the diatoms are. So we're looking at these in particular because the um, the diatoms may be able to tell us something about that ash environment, but also probably a bunch of the diatoms that are present in these because they're, I don't know, something like 8 to 10 million years old. They're probably undescribed diatoms, so um, very likely what we'll do is image them and then ultimately uh, describe some new species from there and potentially some, uh, some new genera as well. So this sample's got a lot of ash in it, and uh, just a few diatoms, and I think that's the case. I think that's the case for um, all of these. They really still have a lot of ash material in them, 
um, it's kind of hard to get the diatoms to separate out from um, all of the ash material um, because there was so much volcanic ash. Um, but the, um, there definitely are some present. So for example, here's in one of these uh, diatoms. It's similar to the ones we were just looking at, um, like an Olicocyra. Um, and then there are some Olicocyra that are sort of ellipsoid that we saw in the previous sample as well. So um, I'm kind of looking at these Olicocyra and also some of the um, other little round things that are in here, the cycloteloids. Um, that's a piece of an Olicocyra, I think. Um, and trying to see if we can find anything cool in here and then use that to um, say something potentially about um, these ancient environments as well. So uh, I've been working on this project uh, for like a week now, so I don't really have a whole lot of uh, um, background on it, but um, uh, my colleague Mark Edlund has been working on it for many years, and um, he and Joe have basically started um, trying to see if we could use these to get some good extractions to get some nice clean samples out and uh, right now most of these don't look that great to me um, in terms of the quality but uh, there are some pretty interesting looking diatoms in here that one's not bad if a little out of focus is it your birthday is it's, that why the funny hat? I just know. It's because we have a thousand followers now. It, we're celebrating. Um, it's not my birthday. Dell is back. He's been working hard. Yeah. Answering phone calls about IT issues. I feel like a lot of your life is phone, well, your work is phone calls. Well, he, he lives at home now, so he does all of the work from, well, you know, I he's a systems administrator. That's kind of crazy. I thought he could like fix computers from his house, you know, like those people who like call you sometimes and they're like, hey, you got a virus on your computer. And you're like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah, just give me your credit card information. And you're like, oh, okay, I can definitely be helped like by just giving you my credit card information. And then they can like somehow fix your computer from a distance. Isn't that crazy? I think maybe you also need to give them your social security number and your yeah. birthday. I mean, yeah, you do that too, obviously. And maybe those three digits on the back of your visa cards or yeah. whatever. And then they just help your computer? Yeah. And that works? Yeah. Huh. What, you don't? I don't have computer problems. Oh. Pacific said that's a cute guy. Uh, the little guy we just passed by was uh, some sort of fragilarioid. Uh, colonial fragilarioid. Um, uh, probably Starosorella. I didn't look closely at the stri, but um, these are Olicocyra like things. And then there's some weird costate thing in here, which I was trying to figure out. And there's these guys. These are some more Olicocyra like things. This one's curled, so like a noodle, like a macaroni noodle. Um, you are? Yeah, that was my nickname in high school. Macaroni Noodle was your nickname? Yeah. I can't prove that or substantiate that claim anyway, but... Do... Is anybody asking for proof? Yes. I feel like if nobody's asking for it, you shouldn't maybe feel like you need to defend it. Macaroni noodle. Yeah, what was your nickname in high school? Uh, I don't know. The stone. Yeah, there was like, the uh, no, because he didn't exist when I was um, in high school. Well, he, he existed, but. In baby, in like pebble form? I mean, he wasn't famous. But probably people would have called me something similar because they're not very creative to be honest. That's fair. That's 
I think maybe Stone Man or Stoner. Sounds rough stuff. Neither of which are very accurate for me. You know how creative people were with my name? Uh, when, well, let's that. see. Um, I think we heard stories of what you had nicknames for. Um, do they rhyme with Mallory? Like calorie? No. Oh. Take, you want to hear it? You want to hear it? The only nickname you ever got was I Mal. W- Mal? Is and that a know. nickname? Yeah. That's just like a shortened version I of know. your name. That's like people calling me Jeff. Well, that's a nickname. Oh, well, then people have called me Jeff before. Mal gal. Oh, yeah. Me could call me Mal gal. I forgot. Yeah. Oh, Laura Warm said, this is also a good application for image recognition software. Scan individual diatoms and show statistics. Is there something like that out there? Uh, I, don't I don't know if people have tried to do image recognition from the SCM. Um, I know they do it with the light microscope stuff, um, but I don't know about whether they've tried it from SCM before. I would imagine that it actually works better from scanning electron microscope than it would from a light microscope, but, um, but, uh, I don't know for sure. All right. Uh, well, we did see some pretty cool diatoms today and, uh, we, uh, stream's getting a little bit long in the day and I've got to get home and, uh, take care of some things for my family. So, um, it's reached that point where we should probably find somebody to raid and, um, have a new target, which is Glorgana. Hopefully we could raid her before she finishes her stream but I think her stream is similar timing to mine. Uh, But if we leave now, we can raid her. So um, why don't we try to do that? And um, maybe we'll be able to get in another stream on Saturday. I'm not positive. And maybe I'll be able to do a little bit of light microscope streaming from home. I'm pretty exhausted for the past week or so. Um, so I haven't really had a, a chance to do much, uh, streaming aside from that. Um, but I do want to thank all the followers that we had today and for people hanging out with us as we celebrate, uh, 1000 followers and now we're up to 1007. So we got seven new followers or something. Um, uh, bit 101, uh, CS own 42 MDS 1161, um, R C R L B Have and I S Soundnator and uh, Stupid Cupid Kid, Cupid's Kid. Um, also, I guess we got more than three. Uh, so those are our followers today. We also had cheers from Micah and um, and a community gift sub that went out from Bobber. I want to say thank you to Bobber. Barbara's a friend of mine. We're working on another project together, uh, potentially streaming some kind of cool stuff. So, um, right. Uh, Thanks for all the people for hanging out. And and we'll catch you next time. I'm going to set it up to raid Glorgana. She, um, she does, uh, um, cuts things up on stream for uh, taxidermy living things well dead, dead things, things. I guess dead yeah things. and sometimes they're a little gross but i looked at the stream and it said not that gross today so um if you're triggered by people uh doing taxidermy you might want to consider not coming along with the raid um otherwise uh we'll go raid uh glorgana so um Thanks to everybody, and um, and we'll see you again. So we're going to go raid now. Anyway. Oh, you can just whatever. She knows who I am, so it'll be fine. All right, let's do it.
Oh my god. Oh, she's got a bird. That's very much a bird. Yeah. She's probably looking for someone to raid and then 